Welcome to Mayo Medical Laboratory's Hot Topics. These presentations provide short discussion of current topics and may be helpful to you in your practice. Our speaker for this program is Dr. Glenn Roberts, a professor of laboratory medicine and pathology and microbiology at Mayo Clinic, as well as a consultant in the Division of Clinical Microbiology. Dr. Roberts discusses the most commonly seen dermatophytes in clinical specimens in North America. This is part one of a two-part presentation. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. Thank you for that introduction, Sharon. I have nothing to disclose. Today we're going to talk about uh, the subject of superficial fungal infections, and these include the dermatophytes that can infect the normal host as well as the immunocompromised host. With the normal host, often they involve the hair, skin, or nails. With the immunocompromised host, since the immune system is diminished, these dermatophytes can attack potentially any site, and so you can expect even systemic disease with these dermatophytes. In terms of the microbiology, there are three genera of dermatophytes that we deal with in the clinical laboratory. And the first genus is the genus Trichophyton. It's characterized by macroconidia that are elongated and pencil to cigar shaped. And it's smooth walled and multi septate and thin walled. The problem is that most of the time you don't see these macroconidia when you're looking at this particular genus. You see microconidia, and the arrangement and, and, and sometimes the shape of these microconidia uh, is what we use for identifying dermatophytes on a traditional basis. So, in general, the microconidia are the things that predominate in most of the cultures, and, and sometimes they're arranged in gray block clusters. Other times they're lined up along the sides of the hyphae, and then there are times when we just have problems getting them to sporulate at all, and we can't we can't tell what they are. This is a slide showing you a, a, a dermatophyte. It belongs to the genus Trichophyte, and you can see the small spores. These are the microconidia, the smaller spores, and the large ones you see in there that are elongated and kind of maybe a little bit of pencil shape are the macroconidia that that characterizes the genus. But finding those really doesn't tell us what the, what the organism is. It's those microconidia that we deal with. The next slide shows the second genus that we're going to talk about is the genus Epidermophyton or Epidermophyton, depending on how you want to pronounce it. This genus only contains one organism, uh, Epidermophyton flocosum, and it produces these large multi-septate smooth-walled club-shaped macroconidia and no microconidia at all. And that's what you see to characterize this genus. The other genus that we deal with uh, in the clinical laboratory is the genus Microsporum. And it's characterized by having large multiseptate, rough-walled, and spindle-shaped macroconidia. And we see these macroconidia most of the time in the cultures, and that's what helps us to identify the genus. However, though, we still see some microconidia in, in select cultures, and so it's a little bit confusing sometimes. But we'll see and talk about these, see the, some, some of these and talk about them more as we go along here. This is a genus Epidermophyton, and it has these club-shaped macroconidia that are smooth-walled. There are no little spikes sticking out on them at all. And they occur in singly or in clusters of two and no more than three. And you can see on here there is a a cluster of three on this one here, the top. And so this is what we use to characterize uh, Epidermophyton. And then the genus Microsporum is characterized by these rough wall macroconidia, in contrast to what we just saw a second ago. The shape of these macroconidia varies depending upon the organism. This one happens to be a bit spindle shape, you can see here. The next slide shows you the common dermatophytes that we see in uh, in the clinical laboratory. Kind of based on order of predominance in some ways, depending on where you are though, but by far and large the, the most common dermatophyte that we see in North America, probably in the world, is Trichophyton rubrum. Trichophyton mentagrophytes, Trichophyton tonsurans, Trichophyton varicosum that you find uh, infecting cattle and we see it in, in humans. Microsporum canis, the one that infects cats and dogs, and we do see it infecting humans. Microsporum ottawini, and Epidermophyton flocosum. The next slide talks a little bit about how these dermatophytes work. 
they are keratinophilic. That's what they invade, the keratinized tissue. And sometimes you can you can almost guess what the organism, what group it might belong to, which genus, by looking at what it involves. The genus trichophyte involves the hair, skin, and nails, so it's all the, all the keratinized tissue. Microsporum infects the hair and the skin and not the nails, and epidermophilin infects the skin and the nails and not the hair. So this is just something that uh, you kind of use as a little bit of a guide. The thing about dermatophytes is that they, they infect uh, normal hosts all the time. Probably one of the most common group of fungi that we see in the clinical laboratory are dermatophytes. We don't see them involving uh, immunocompromised patients very often, but certainly immunocompetent patients, yes. The next slide talks about you can group these dermatophytes in another way if you wish. This sh slide shows you how they're grouped in the environment. Dermatophytes are three major groups. Geophilics, the ones that are found in the soil. And uh, zoophilic, the ones that infect living animals, including humans. And then anthropophilic, the ones that infect humans, uh, and that's all. And they don't infect any other animal source at all. So three genera, we don't use this characterization very often in the clinical lab. It doesn't have a whole lot of relevance to what we do. The next slide shows you some examples, though, of these, uh, these three groups. The geophilic group, Microsporum gypsum. This is one that's found in the soil, and people like florists and other people who are handle soil are the ones who acquire infection by this organism. Zoophilic uh, group contains uh, the organism that infects dogs and cats, Microsporum canis, and this is one that's highly infectious and, inf and infects not only the animals but humans as well. And there have been a number of outbreaks where someone will bring some uh, kittens in to a nursing home or some other place where there's some some folks all gather together, live together, and uh, you'll find that, that pretty soon uh, that whole population, if they've handled that cat or dog, will come down with Microsporum canis infection. Trichophyte mentagrophytes uh, is a zoophilic organism. It, it infects animals, but it can infect humans as well. And then Trichophyte varicosum is the one I mentioned that infects cattle. And people who have cattle herds, dairy herds, oftentimes will get the infection from those infected cows. So these are these are examples of these two groups. And then the anthropophilic group that only infects humans. Really the three here that, that infect humans exclusively would be trichophyte and rubrum, trichophyte and tonsorans, and epidermophyte and flocosum. Trichophyte and mentagrophytes can infect animals as well as humans. And so there's some overlap with these groups and they don't fit nicely into compartments like you'd like to put them in. So this is kind of how we can group these organisms to make a little more sense out of them. And the next slide shows you kind of what goes on in the clinical laboratory. One well, of the first things that the dermatologist will generally ask for, and they do it oftentimes in their own office, is what are you going to see in a direct microscopic examination of a piece of skin or nail or maybe a piece of hair? You may find just hyphae that are septate and have no pigment, and so they're hyaline. And then you may find some of the hyphae that are breaking down into arthrocanidae, those rectangular spores. And that may be what you'll see in a direct microscopic examination. It doesn't tell you for sure that it's a dermatophyte, and it certainly doesn't tell you which one it is. But it suggests that there's a dermatophyte here if it's from one of the samples that we talked about, the hair, skin, or the nails. There, there are other things that can infect those sites. But for by and large, for the most part, the dermatophytes are the ones that we see doing that. The next slide shows you a KOH prep, potassium hydroxide prep, just showing you hyphae in there that have septations. And they, it looks a little brown, uh, just happens to be the way this slide is. But you can see the septate hyphae in there, and that's maybe all that you see. And that's good enough to suggest a dermatophyte. The next slide shows you the same thing, except it shows you the hyphae are kind of inter intertwined amongst the, uh, the epithelial cells that you see there, and it's hard to see if it's septate or not, but they are narrow hyphae. Next slide shows you another classification for things in this group, and that is a classification based on which anatomic site these organisms infect. And this helps a clinician because we often know which dermatophytes involve the hair, or the skin, or the nails. Not necessarily the hair, skin, or nails, but may involve just the, the feet, may involve the hands, may involve the scalp, the facial area. And we have names for those, those clinical conditions. 
how we characterize these clinical presentations is by calling them ringworm of whatever it happens to be. And tinea pettis means ringworm of the foot. Tinea refers to ringworm. So tinea pettis is the Latin for infection of the feet, primarily involving the soles, the toe webs, and the areas between the fourth and the fifth toes. And that seems to be a characteristic that you see. The next slide shows you a foot with infection between the fourth and fifth toes. And you may not see anything but just some simple scaling of the skin, or you may see an area that's really infected. You see a lot of erythema and a lot of exfoliation of the skin. And then the next slide shows you an extreme case of tinea pettis, where this person obviously had been in contact with some water for a long period of time, and this dramatified invaded the feet and the nails, and you can see everything is infected. It would take a long time to treat a patient with that sort of thing. These dermatophytes, for the most part, are nuisances more than they are uh, anything severe, except in a case like this. The next slide shows you another clinical condition called tinea curis, ringworm of the groin, or the perianal area. We know of at least one dermatophyte that causes infection in that area, and the next slide shows you what tinea curis looks like. This is where the area in the groin, the inguinal area, or the perianal area, gets all red, and inflamed and it has a very active border that you can see on the left hand side of the slide you see where the redness stops that's the active border and on the right hand side you can see the same thing if you were going to make a KOH preparation from a, a patient who had a dermatophyte infection whether it's tinea curis or something else where you would like to go to get that sample would be at the, the advancing edge of this infection so you'd be right there where the redness stops that's where the dermatophyte will start to invade the normal tissue, and that's where you're going to find it. Also, on the right-hand side of the slide, you see there's a satellite lesion sitting over there. It's a typical ringworm lesion. So in reality, if you get right down to it, this is a case of what we call tinea corpus because it means that, that it involves more than just the groin, and it probably involves some other sites. And if you were to see that patient, you more than likely would see some sites on the smooth skin of the trunk. So tinea curis does look like what you see there along the, the groin area. The next slide talks about tinea corpus. Tinea corpus is an infection of the smooth skin of the trunk and the extremities. And uh, that happens frequently in some patients. And it's exclusive of the face, the foot, the groin, the hands, or the scalp area. So it's the smooth skin of the trunk and the extremities for sure. That's how it pretty much presents. So these clinical presentations help the clinician because we can sort of link which dermatophytes cause these particular entities, and we'll show you that as we go along here. The next slide shows you a case of tinea corpus, and this lady has lesions that you see on the smooth skin of the trunk, and they're typical ringworm lesions. The one down at the lower right-hand side is actually a very typical one, and what happens with these lesions is that as they begin to heal, the center of the lesion shows the first area of healing. And then you see, after a while, little evidence of infection in the center, but you see an advancing border. And you see an area within there that is still erythematous. And that's what kind of gives it the ringworm appearance they talk about. The next slide is tinea capitis. This is an infection of the scalp, the eyebrows, and the eyelashes. And it primarily occurs in young children before the age of puberty. Been in the past used to be a real common thing. I don't know how common it is these days. But tinea capitis, though, generally for the most part, refers to infection of the scalp. The next slide shows you a child's scalp, and if you look, you see that some of the hair's gone off of there. That's, that's called alopecia, and that just means baldness. And that may be all that that child may experience is the loss of hair. In some cases, the, 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 the lesions may become uh, much more apparent and uh, uh, go down much deeper in the tissue and look much more severe. And uh, we have seen cases like that before. Sometimes what happens with the, even with, the, with all the ringworm infections, for that matter, is they may get secondarily infection, infected with something like staph, and they get folliculitis where the hair follicles are, and they'll, they'll get terribly infected with, uh, with something that you have to treat with antibiotics. The next slide is a term that is used as a kind of a general term. It's called onychomycosis. 
and it kind of means the infection of the nails and the surrounding tissue, the perinicia of the nails. And in these cases, uh, things other than dermatophytes can cause a nicomycosis. Uh, things like aspergillus, fusarium, and other things that we see in the clinical laboratory besides dermatophytes can actually be involved in causing a nicomycosis. So this is where we branched out just a little bit more. The next slide shows you a case of onychomycosis where all these nails are involved. And to treat these nails with uh, an antibiotic, and a fungal antibiotic would take an awful long time, but of course what has to happen is the nail bed has to be sterilized down below the, the, the nail you see going towards the hand. It has to be sterilized and as it grows, a new nail grows out, sterile, the old nail has to be clipped off. And a lot of times what the dermatologist may do is just to avulse these nails and take them right off and then start treating with an antifungal agent and sterilize the nail bed so that when the, the new nails grow back out, they're sterile. The next slide shows you another ringworm, Tinea pettis. Tinea pettis involves the trichophyte rubrum, trichophyte mentagrophytes, and epidermophyllum flocosum. Notice you see the same three again causing Tinea cruris. And you're going to see that pretty much the same dermatophytes cause the same clinical entities most of the time. So the common ones that we see are Epidermophyllum flocosum, Trichophyte rubrum, and Trichophyte mentagrophytes. They cause uh, Tinea cruris. Tinea corpus, same two, with the addition of Microsporum canis. Tinea capitis, there are three new ones that we haven't talked about. Trichophyte tonsurans, microspore modawini, and trichophyte violation. These are some that are seen infrequently, but nevertheless are seen, and they cause tinea captus along with uh, microsporum canis. So you never know what you're going to get when you try to culture one of these things. It depends on where the patient's been, the contact they've had, and so on. So you kind of have to be ready to identify the ones that we know are commonly associated with these cl clinical entities. The next slide shows you a schematic of how to identify these dermatophytes, at least one. And I did it for uh, all of the dermatophytes that we deal with on a routine basis. Not every one of them out there because there are a huge number of dermatophytes, most of which we don't see. So Epidermophyllum flocosum. If you look at a culture, generally it's a culture that you're going to have on mycocell agar or cornmeal agar. Cornmeal agar are used in the clinical laboratory. We call it white cornmeal agar is very good for allowing sporulation of these dermatophytes. Mycocell agar is nothing more than Sabro's agar with chloramphenicol and, and cyclohexamide in it, and it allows these uh, dermatophytes to grow in primary recovery. And so it's a good primary recovery medium for dermatophytes. Then if you want to subculture to cornmeal agar, then you begin to see the sporulation. And what you're going to see with epidermop and flocosum is these large, smooth wall, club-shaped macro community that we saw a while ago that are, are, occur singly or in clusters of no more than two or three. And the colony is described in all the literature as khaki colored. It's kind of a yellow-green color. And in the center of the colonies, most of the time, you're going to see a white area. And that's called an area of pleomorphism. That means that what's happened to this culture is, as it grows, the center part of it becomes sterile. And if you try to subculture that center part for a culture for a laboratory work or something, you're going to end up with nothing more than just white, sterile hyphae. So if you take it from an area where you see sporulation or from the area where the youngest part of the culture is, uh, or in between there in the center, you're going to see the culture that is sporulated. And it will produce those large, club-shaped, smooth ball macro canidian that would be epidermops and flocosum. The next slide just talks about what you might see. There are other things that you might see with this organism. One would be um, cl Clamidal conidia. These are kind of overwintering spores, and Epidermophyllum flocosum is kind of notorious for producing these nonspecific Clamidal conidia in hyphae, sometimes on the end of a hyphal strand, sometimes in the middle. These macro conidia are blunt, though, that you see. They're rounded on the ends, really club shaped, and they don't have any rough wall at all, and they're multi celled. And we mentioned they occur in clusters of two or three, and sometimes singly. Another thing that I want to mention is that for those of you who do teaching is that if you decide to keep your cultures in the refrigerator uh, before to keep them for, for subculture for later, with the epidermophyllum flocosum, it will die. It is not thermotolerant. It's, it's killed by the cold. 
it's just a bit of trivia but sometimes when you work your teaching environment you kind of need to know things like that the next slide shows you what you saw a while ago it's just upside down from what you saw it looks like a different slide but it's the same one after morphoglycosin with those multi-cell smooth wall club shaped macro occurring clusters of two or three and sometimes even singly so this is what it would look like this is a, you have to remember another thing and that is when we take photographs of these things we look for the picture perfect ones and it takes a long time to find them because they don't all look this good the next one is one that we see in the clinical laboratory and you can see it doesn't look like it's exactly as clear as the others but it has the same shape and there you see uh, the very same arrangement of the conidia the next slide talks about the cultural morphology and I mentioned before the, the khaki colored pale olive green maybe that would do it um, some of them are white in the center a lot of times they have these uh, folds in them as they're growing up and they look kind of velvety and I mentioned this white sterile hyphae that grew up in the center after about two or three weeks of incubation this one is one you, you can identify by just looking at the um, microscopic morphology uh, after you subcultured it from a primary recovery medium the next slide shows you what it looks like and this is the khaki color that it, people talk about I don't know if I'd call it khaki color or not but it, it has this kind of greenish yellow looking colony and you notice that there's a little bit of white on all on all these colonies here is on the top it's the heaped up area in the center is what I was talking about that becomes pleomorphic this ends part one of the superficial fungi and fungal infections and we will talk about some of the other groups in part two